I think uh, new technologies introduce a lot of uncertainty and complexity into the nuclear equation. Um, a wide range of new technologies, including missile defense, uh, conventional prompt global strike technologies, including hypersonic weapon systems, um, autonomous weapon systems, AI, cyber, etc., they can all potentially interfere with and threaten nuclear weapon systems or their command and control and communication systems and making nuclear weapon systems more vulnerable. Uh, so um, for two countries to stabilize their nuclear relationship, they have to find ways uh, to uh, avoid uh, exaggerated threat perception about these uh, new technologies from destabilizing their nuclear relationship. In some cases, um, new technologies contribute, uh, contribute uh, both to the offense and defense sides. For example, uh, autonomous weapon technologies, unmanned systems. Um, a country like United States can use unmanned weapon platforms to help detect, track, and trail Chinese nuclear weapon platforms, uh, such as uh, road mobile uh, missile vehicles or SSBNs underwater. On the other hand, China can also use unmanned weapon systems or unmanned military systems to help protect its nuclear platforms. For example, China can use unmanned underwater vessels uh, as decoys. It can emulate the noise features of a uh, different uh, of, of a nuclear uh, strategic submarine and therefore attract the, the enemy attention away from the real Chinese SSBN. So this makes the offense defense balance equation more complex. Uh, there is no clear uh, advantage uh, introduced by these new uh, technologies. And therefore, both sides would try to invest as much resources as possible into these new technologies in order to shift the balance of offense defense towards its own favor. And that makes things extremely dangerous. That basically leads to a new round of arms race not only at the nuclear level, but also within the domain of the new technology. Um, so um, I think that's a real challenge uh, faced by uh, new technologies and also nuclear weapon systems. There is no guarantee uh, looking at the technology evolution in the world, what is going on in different parts of the world, um, especially the emergence of disruptive technologies that are unfolding in different parts of the world, giving a big threat or, or, or different assumptions whether the nuclear deterrence will be uh, effectively in operation in different parts of the world, particularly um, cyber weapons, artificial intelligence, ballistic missile defense, uh, MIRVs, many other such disruptive weapons uh, are proliferating in different parts of the world and simultaneously questioning the basic premise of nuclear deterrence that is survivability of those weapons. For example, intrusive surveillance technologies are available and uh, it is very really difficult to hide uh, nuclear arsenals of a country. Um, therefore, there is a big question of survivability of nuclear weapons and therefore the premise of nuclear deterrence is now in large question. Particularly when we look at South Asia or in a larger cost context Southern Asia, there are three countries which are uh, very much in competition with each other uh, developing this type of disruptive technologies. India for that matter um, has um, acquired BMD and uh, reportedly it has been deployed as well. 
China, on the other hand, uh, has entered this um, uh, you know, race much earlier. Even on the MIRV technology, China is the first uh, you know, country to introduce to the strategic domain, followed by Pakistan as a response to India's strategic moves. In Pakistan has also uh, acquired those disruptive technologies. So in a sense, what we see in Southern Asia, a kind of triangular competition unfolding, which is really, really dis disruptive and, uh, and, and threatening. The greatest change that has happened uh, in, in our times now is the cyber, the information age changes. Uh, how do nuclear weapons get deployed from peacetime storage to battlefield weapon systems and how do the communication part? I'm talking about the communication part. We get into different problems here because things are in control, things are in command, communication, all are good as long as peacetime, you know, paradigm is followed. The moment it gets into deployed mode, even though it's all on their own territory, it's not too far, they all know their garrisons, they know where it is, the communication regimen changes. And in this cyber age, how much can you rely on that? That's one impact on that. Uh, so the greatest challenge to them is one. And then you have artificial intelligence, you have emerging technologies, you have drones, you have UAVs. There are so many technological changes that are happening that can actually start challenging uh, uh, the, the command and control. Plus the evolution of technology also f is enabling countries to change their ideas of from purely counter value targeting to counter control targeting to counter force targeting this all these technologies are enabling so the command configuration is going to change uh, satellites surveillance isr equipments are changing so that simplified command and control that was existing in the early part of the nuclear age in south asia in particular is going to be very different when it comes to the era that we are talking about now the new source of vulnerabilities uh, that are emerging now. Uh, we're not sure whether command and control truly means uh, interception by cyber to cripple the command system is a good idea because then we don't know whether the weapons and the systems are actually uh, already enabled to fire on their own. You would rather want them to be in control rather than out of control. So you want to decapitate or you don't want to decapitate because you just want the weapons to be in control, assertive control. These are the big questions that are happening because of emerging technologies. Now it's cyber uh, you know, capabilities. Can you disrupt a state's entire command and control system so that you, know, they, uh, you render the force completely impotent? Right, and neutralize their secure second strike capability by eliminating their ability to launch nuclear weapons. Hypersonic glide vehicles are basically penetrators against missile defenses. I develop a capability, you develop, you know, try to develop some way around it. Cruise missiles are also ways to penetrate and defeat missile defenses. So uh, states will develop uh, some capability to target hypersonic glide vehicles or cruise missiles and the adversary will try to develop something around those then, right? And so this is a constantly evolving dynamic. Uh, and so there's no this will never end. It's a never-ending evolution of capabilities, uh, but it's uh, all centered around this basic requirement for deterrence, which is I need to be able to have forces that survive and be able to hit back against you, and you're trying to prevent me from doing that. And all of these technologies are in the service of that basic requirement. When it comes to assessing the effects of emerging technologies on strategic stability or crisis stability, I think there's a really strong presumption, uh, an assumption that's very pervasive in existing dialogue, that these developments will be destabilizing and they will be dangerous and that they will have large independent effects on the prospects for conflict or the prospects uh, of conflict initiation. Certainly, I think it's worthwhile to study these technologies and to proceed cautiously in anticipating what their effects might be. But it's also important to realize that a lot of the discussion is highly speculative. We obviously don't have data about the future, and so a lot of the discussion really is imagining things that could go wrong. And part of what I think we need to bring into the conversation is, first of all, some historical evidence about the effects of technologies as they emerged in the past, and secondly, an appreciation that 
technology does not exist in a vacuum. Technology always uh, exerts whatever effects it has on conflict or stability in the context of other strategic, political, even cultural and social factors. And so, yes, we need to look at emerging technologies, but I think it's unlikely that we will find a straightforward relationship between the introduction of a new technology and radically improved or increased prospects of conflict initiation or escalation. The story is just likely to be more complicated than that based on what we know of past episodes of technological change.